I don't know about you, I'm starting to like Formula One again. It's one of those amazing sports. You get everything ready for that pull away. And then by lap 10, you fast asleep. You're like snoring like it's no tomorrow. And you hear the commentator getting excited, and then you wake up and you're like, oh, yes. You know, that's Verstappen won again. Sorry, Tomo. And uh, not Hamilton. And you get excited and you're happy. Do you guys know the name of the guy changing the tires? We don't know who he is. Kurs. <laughs> Kurs van Tonder. We know who won the race because they get to stand on the podium. Have you seen that picture with all the people behind the cars? That is the team that makes sure that that guy gets on the podium. Can we put the next picture up? Do anybody know who this oak is? Anybody? It's not Quiz. Does anybody know who this is? Soccer? Okay. Okay. Put the next picture up for me. Who's that? Well, you put two and two together. The first guy was the St. Bolt's coach, Glenn Mills. Don't know him from a bar of soap. But behind that man is somebody that is there for him, that encourages him, that trains him, that makes sure that he becomes the best. We've got no idea who he is. The last picture. We know who they are. Okay, definitely we do. And then the last picture. We don't know half of these oaks. I mean, the guy in the pink looks like me. We have no idea, okay, we, we, we know who they are. But you know what, that's the coaching staff. But we saw Sia Kulisi living the trophy, but we don't see these guys behind the scenes, working themselves thickened. This morning, if you can go with me to 1 Corinthians 12, from verse 12. And I just want you to remember these pictures. just want you to, as we carry on, especially the Formula One pit stop, just keep that in mind, as we're just going to journey into... One or two things, um, and have a look at that. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, city about 600 to 700,000 people, an important port city along a major trade route in the modern day Greece. As a wealthy metropolis, but Corinth was a melting pot for ancient world culture and had reputation for sexual immorality, pagan idolatry, and corruption. In other words, he was talking about Gauteng. That's just basically what it says. Will you agree with me? This city, Corinth, needed to see a victorious Christ. They needed to see a Jesus on the podium. But if I look at this, the team was busy messing up the pit stop. Paul gets a letter telling him what is going on there. In modern day technology, he would get a WhatsApp saying, Paul, what is problem you saw? Paul gets this letter Paul writes this back to this church. It's a pastoral letter to a fractured church struggling under the influence of the culture around them. And Paul is urging this thing. He's urging them to stand in unity. He's urging these guys, get together as a family and stand together. Read with me from verse 12. Just as a body through one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews, Gentiles, slaves or free, we are all given the, sum, given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, and I highlighted this in my Bible, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wants them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one Body. I'm going to stop there. It carries on till verse 31. You know what? I've been here since 2006, 2007. So I can very easily say, you know, I've been here for quite a while. I definitely want to be the flexing bicep in this church. 
But then I look at mine and look at some of these bigger oaks, then I put my shirt on, I'm like, no, okay, I'm not going to be the bicep. Because these some oaks are serious bicep in this church, all these crossfitters. And I'm thinking, you know what, maybe I can be the mouth, no, I can't be the mouthpiece, because I'm with, between the English and Afrikaans, I wear the tail deliciously. Yeah. So that's not the best one. You know, okay, yes, I've got a set of calves. Maybe I can be the calf in this church, you know. Maybe I, friends, we come very opinionated and we try to say where do I fit in what do I do I don't know about you but I realize very quickly it's not what I choose or what I say God picks and God places have you ever seen a body two legs and there's just ears I see things in pictures this is a Lilica picture this is Friday the 13th right here yeah. or a body with just eyes checking it out every corner uh, there's some moms I think you do have those eyes Yes, like it. I remember as a kid, you even thinking of doing it, your mom goes, uh-uh. And you're like, how? Body full of eyes. You know what? It's not a body, hey. It's a monster. It's a monster. Can I tell you the sad truth? There are churches out there that look like monsters. There are bodies out there that look like monsters. Because in there, everybody wants to be the ear. Everybody wants to be that. Everyone wants to... They want to be that. They want to be this. They choose that. They choose that. It's not a body. It's a monster. My prayer is that this family would not be a monster, but we will be one body. And as people walk in here, they would see the love of Christ like never before. That is my prayer. That is my desire. Verse 18. But in fact, that but almost clears up everything that was said before. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wants them to be. God picks, God places. If God tells you today, you are the claim twinkie in this church. You know what is the purpose of a claim twinkie? Do you, does anybody know? Well, okay, I didn't know that. Term, thank you. <laughs> Have you ever kicked that claim twinkie? Papi, your brain tells you there's a claim twinkie. It lets you know there's something there. You walk in the middle of the night, because I've got my route to the fridge, eh? I know where it is. But then I've got these amazing two girls that sometimes leave something in the pathway, and I trip over that thing, and you fall on your knee. Your brain tells you, Poppy, there's pain here. There's a problem here. You know what? Every part in our body has got a function, has got a certain thing to do. I've so many times heard in our church, how people knew coming to this church, and the first thing that they say is, this is probably one of the most friendliest churches. Why? Because there's a plain Twinkie greeting people as they come into that door that's been through a week of hell, that's been through a week of stress, and there's one friendly face that says, how are you doing? You feel insignificant. You feel, what, man, how can I make a difference? I'll tell you what, the guy that puts that little bolt in that tire makes a big Take that bolt out and see what happens to that tire. That car will not go on the podium. But when you and I realize where God picks us and He places us and we start doing what God tells us to do, I tell you what, something happens with this body. We go from monster to amazing. Okay. There's two guys in the Old Testament that they looked at themselves and they said, I do not fit in this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. The first one is Gideon. Judges 6 verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he, the Lord said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. This oak probably, his first instinct was, where's the warrior? Because all I do is worry about other things, but I'm not a warrior. This oak said, if you go read the scriptures, it says, In everything, my family is the least, and in my family, I'm the runt of the litter. I'm that dog with the flappy ear and the funny eye and the stick in a port. That's me. How on earth are you going to... Mighty what? Mighty warrior. Not a chance. God picks. God plays. God looked at Gideon very differently the way that Gideon looked at himself. There's some of you that looked in the mirror and you look and you feel like the runt of the litter. I tell you what. God looks at you. He picks you and he places you in this body. And he says, I've got a part for you. I've got a place for you. We know the rest of the story. Gideon goes to 300 guys and he wins the battle that God has picked him for. After standing there and saying, Lord, not me. The second guy is Moses. Exodus 3.11. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh 
and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent. It feels like me. Give me slops and a t-shirt. I'm not the guy in a suit and a tie and feeling good about myself. Neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Moses looks at his disability. Moses looks at the problem and he says, Lord, I can't do this. God picks and God places. He does not look at what you see as a problem, what you see as a, as a, a disformity. God says, I pick you and I place you. He looked at Moses way different than Moses looked at himself. Friends, you and I need to start seeing how God sees us. Every single one of you sitting in this church, I tell you, from the smallest to the oldest to the most amazing to DJ, we all got a part to play in this family. God picks you and God plays you. Tom said it from the beginning and he did not know my notes. You are an amazing bunch of people. I tell you that. This church is an amazing church. And I pray every single day that we will not be that disformed body, but every single one of us will, from the plain twinkie to the pinky to the thumb to whatever God says, this is what I want you to do. Why? Because He will be glorified in that. It's not about me and you. It's not about me and you. I'll sum up the punchline in there. Friends, it's not about us. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. How do we do this? Three things that I feel that I'm just going to look at. The first one, surrender and obey. Surrender and obey. God picked and God placed. We come in with our own plans and our own ideas, but we realize like a Moses and a Gideon, God knows far, far better. To surrender means to stop resisting. Give in, give up, healed, submit. Give in, submit. You know what? I, I have that picture. You know, I, we had a little Jack Russell. So when you come to that little Jack Russell, she just rolls on her back. She submits and yields immediately because I'm a little bit bigger than the Jack Russell. Just a little bit. Not much. But she yields completely. She just lies there. Friends, it is time that you and I submit and yield. Um, James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves to God. Psalm 40 verse 8, I desire to do your will. You know the song we sing, I Surrender All. You know that song. An amazing song. Friends, it can be pure lip service. By just singing, Lord, I surrender. I surrender, I surrender all. It can be lip service we sing. It's a different thing. When we go and we have a look at Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I stand by the door and I knock. And if you open up, if you open up, I will come in and I will have a feast with you. Friends, surrendering is when you and I open up to Him every single area of our lives. And we say, God, come in. Even that cupboard in your room at the bottom with all that stuff in, you say, God, I surrender that to you. My kid's room, I surrender that to you. My finances, my lock, my everything, I surrender that to you. And I'm telling you, as I prepare this message, I feel there's people here that you are not surrendering everything to God. There's some hurt in your life that you are holding on to and you are standing still by that. And the opposite is also there are people that are stopping at the victories that God has given you before. You're stopping at that and you're still looking at that trophy. And you're, yes, you're shining that trophy of the 10 years. Have you guys ever seen a who hunts here? Can I quickly see who hunted before or who goes hunting? There has to be people. Okay, I've got one day. I've got two, three. Okay, January, I want Bolton, eh? That's actually all I wanted to know, if there's anybody here. Boltong, dry horse, lacquer. Have you seen when these oaks track a deer or whatever they want to shoot? A kudu. Let's call it a kudu for whatever case. When they see the spurkies, what do you call it? The tracks. Yes, my English air time is finished, eh? Thank you, Eva. When they come to that track, you will... These oaks are amazing. They can look at that track and they go, ooh, it's a female... And there's so many kilograms. And I don't know how they see it by looking at that track, but they know that. But you know what they never do? They never stand by that track and go, oh, it makes me think of the one that got away. Oh, that, oh, that was, oh, man. Or on the other side, they don't go and they stand and they go, yes, that one against my wall with the worms sticking out. What a trophy. 
What an amazing trophy. Friends, that hunter looks, where's the following? Where's the following one? Because they've got a mission. They want to get to the next point. You and I, when we surrender to Christ, we can't linger at one place in the hurt that happened to me. It's real. I get that. But friends, we need to surrender to God and say, Lord, even that hurt in my life, come and take over. Even the places where I won victories, Lord, I want to see more victories. I surrender that to you. That hunter chases after what he's looking after. Friends, it's time for me and you to start chasing after what God has got for you. So have you ever seen dad running after his little one? No, for me it doesn't count because I'm too slow. But uh, your, your, your light you will run and you will chase after them. No, sorry, it's the other way around. My, my mistake. You run away and the light he chases you. But they can never catch you because you're too fast. But that's what I'm saying. In my case, it won't, won't count. So let's say, for instance, Thomas got a little Tommy and little Tommy is chasing big Tommy and he's just chasing. He's never going to get to him. Am I right? But you know what? There's a certain time in this game that the dad turns around and he runs towards the son and he picks him up. It is time for me and you to chase after God. Greg says that time after time, God does not reveal himself to the casual seeker. But it's when you and I surrender and say, Lord, this pain, this hurt, this victory, these things that I'm hiding from you, I am surrendering to you and I'm chasing after you with every fiber of my beings. There's going to come a time when he stops, he turns around and he's going to pick you up. Friends, everything in you, surrender to God. Every area of your life, surrender to God. As I'm sitting here, you have already got that in your head. Hmm, there's this, there's that, there's my finances, there's my kids, there's that. Surrender to God. He knows far better. Once we surrender, we obey. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. An amazing time. He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass me by, but not my will, but your will. And he prays that, and he says, after he surrendered, he obeys, and he does what God tells him to do. John 15, verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. And Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, he replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Who hears the word of God and obey it. It's one thing when you and I surrender and God tells you, in this family, you're going to do this. Friends, do what God tells you to do. It's time for us to action and say, Lord, I'm not just going to sit and I'm just going to keep the seat warm. It's time for me to stand up and do what God has called me to do. Number two, keep the unity. 1 Corinthians 12, 20. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 24, 25. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division. That was the whole crux of this, this chapter, what Paul is writing, and he says, guys, it is time that we should get together, unite, stand as one. We won't agree on everything. I get that. I mean, can you guys believe there's actually people in this church that support the bulls? <laughs> they, they are. They will come right. I've, I've got faith. We actually got a deliverance service after this for them. <laughs> Lay hands, everything. Burn that jersey. We'll do everything for you, you know? You won't agree on everything, guys. That's okay. I mean, who's, who's married here? Okay, don't put your hands up now because this might go south very quickly. Have you ever agreed on the curtains in your house? No, because you just say, wifey, do what you want. I've got a pink duvet with flowers. And I love it. It's my favorite one in the world. I'll sleep under it. I'll cuddle this thing. It's the best thing. There's certain things that you and I will not agree with. You know what? The person will walk in here. He's not going to look like you. He's not going to smell like you. You know what? His personality might be completely different to you. We are not going to agree on everything, but we are going to agree on this, that we will make his name great. We're going to agree on this, that we will lift up the King of Kings. We will agree on this, that we will take his name out here and put him on the podium as number one of our lives. We will do that. We will agree on that. And Paul says, there's many parts, but there's one body. You and I will look at things, we will see things. Friends, when we are part of this family, we will make sure that our Jesus is victorious. That is what we will do. How are we going to do this? Number one, love one another. 
greatest command from Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. That is the first and greatest command. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. How will we grow in unity? Start loving God with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole soul. Why? Because you put an effort. You put something in. It's not just like, oh, I love him. Yeah. Friends, you put time into it. You put effort into it. It's like somebody that becomes a bodybuilder. That guy does not look at the weight and go, yes, my pecs is growing, eh? <laughs> Woo! No, puppy. That, oh, start eating 24 eggs or something stupid. He lifts that weights up. He's there 4 o'clock in the morning. He's probably back there 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He puts an effort into it. But you and I want to get closer to God by giving Him two seconds of our lives and say, Lord, thank you for this amazing day. <laughs> to you tonight. Tell you what, it's time that you and I start getting to that place that we every fiber in our beings, heart, soul, and mind, we say, Lord, I love you with everything in me. With my wallet, I love you. With my kids, I love you. With my life, I love you. With my business, I love you. With my wife, I love you. With every being, with every fiber that's in me, I love you. And I surrender it to you. Why? Because it's all about you. I'm not on this earth for my own pleasure. I'm not on this earth so that I can feel good, look good, or be anything. I am here because you have picked me and you have placed me here. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. Friends, let's start loving God with everything in us. I tell you what, it's easy to start loving the people around you. Because my God said he loved that person so much that he died for him. And that love he places in your heart. When you look at the person next to you and you realize, hey, Hang on, this oak's got still this blue bull shirt on. It's okay. I'll still hug him. I'll still love him. Because there's something greater out there that him and I will achieve. It's not about the, anything else. It's about putting Jesus on the podium. And you and I are part of that Formula One team to make sure that when it stops, we are there and we do our part. We do everything so that we can see our Christ victorious. Second thing, we pray for each other. Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Keep praying for each other. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It is time that we can wake up in the morning and start seeing faces in front of us. And we say, Lord, I pray for so-and-so. I bring so-and-so in front of you. I think of so-and-so. Lord, bless this person. It is time that we start loving this body and we start caring for each other. That your time from driving here to your work is not listening to some silly radio station. It is actually saying, God, put the people's faces in front of me that I can do what your scripture says. I pray for them as I think of them. I pray for them as I think of them. I tell you what, when you walk into this place and you see that person face to face, there will be a love. There will be something happening in our hearts. There's a shift in our lives when we pray for each other. There's a shift in how we act towards each other when we pray for each other. Because we realize, hang on, we are shoulder to shoulder in this. It's not about you doing your thing, you doing your thing, I'm just plotting on you. No, 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 no. Shoulder to shoulder. We are making sure that our Christ is victorious. Every single one of us, that is what we do. Galatians 3.28 there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Talking about unity. And then Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasing it is when God's people live in unity. Number three. Cover the weak. 1 Corinthians 12, 22, 23. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seems to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. If you've got something on your arm, you've got like a weird arm, hey? You've got like a funny left arm. What do you do with that thing? Talk seriously. Are you going to show the whole world, hey, check my funny arm? <laughs> no, we cover it up, hey? If you've got like a cut on your arm or something weird, if, if there's like some funny sore there and this thing going here, like here, you're not going to walk around and let everybody check your seer arm out. You're probably going to cover it up. Can I tell you what? We are going to have people, and we have people that's going to walk in these doors that's got extremely painful situations going on in their lives. What does the Bible say? We need to cover them. Not with shame, 
we cover them with God's love. We're going to have people coming in here that will walk in here that will look amazing, but there's going to be things in their lives, and we're going to pick it up as a body, and we're not going to shame them, but we will cover them in love. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us, when people walk in here with that hurt, that brokenness, as God has drawn us back to him, it is our job to say we will help you that you can go back to him. We will point them back to our Christ. It's not about us, friends. It's all about God. And 1 Peter 4.8, I love this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers. When they walk in here, friends, cover each other as they walk in here. God picks and God places. We have been picked by God and placed here. We need to see our God victorious in our city. You are placed in this amazing family, but you are placed here for a purpose. And you are part of this team. Together we will see God's kingdom come and His will be done. I love that song, when the music fades, all is stripped away. It's all about you, Lord. It's not about us, friends. It's got nothing to do about me and you. And maybe this morning, God just needs to strip some stuff off of us, take things out of our lives, because it's all about Him. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. This is an amazing family. To be part of this family, I tell you what, I said it in the first service, and I was a little bit vulnerable. July, June, July, and August was probably three months I don't want to have over in my life. It was horrible. It was really bad. But in those three months, and I'm not exaggerating, here's my wife. For three months, my phone did not stop ringing. For three months, I did not stop getting messages. For three months, we had food in our fridge that we didn't make. For three months, other people paid my rent. Why? Because one hurt and the rest of the body hurt as well. And that body looked after. That's why I will live for this body. I will want to be part of everything so that I can see my cross glorified. This is an amazing church, friends. This is an amazing church. And I'm not saying it to be, there's the forum peak, I'm Philippine, now you're part of us. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this body will make sure that Christ will be glorified through everything. I see it every single day. I want to finish with this last picture. Now that's me when I was 13 years old, a good swimmer. Swag, how do you guys know? No, it's not me. Yes, like that, man. What do you see sticking out there? The head. Where's the rest of that body? It's underwater, doing what? Just chilling there. As I look at that face, he's not chilling like, a, chilling like a villain there, not a chance. That body is working, but we can't see that body. Look at the scripture, Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. The head is sticking out there. Can't see the body, but the body is operating. Friends, may everything that we do glorify Christ. That his head will be seen in and through our lives, in and through this church, in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our families. Christ, the head of this church. May they not see the body. I mean, it's pointless if the head is done and his bum is sticking out. That's a lopsided swimmer. That's me doing the, the scuba dive session or something. That's not going to work. And you're, not, you're just going to look at this and go, it's just forget me, did he prank you? But when that head is out, you can see determination. You can see something happening there. And that body is working. Friends, we are at the end of the year. I know we're tired, but I'm looking at what God wants to do in and through this church. We are going to have an amazing next year of taking ground. What the enemy is stealing from us, we're going to take ground. And it will only happen if this body makes sure that we do our part, every single one of us. I love John 3.30. It says, God, you must become greater that I must become less. And that's my prayer. Lord, more of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. Please stand with me. Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just 
maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you. Maybe a, a thumbs up. Maybe you can subscribe to the channel, do whatever, just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you. And this, this, this hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me. But the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus. I want to say two things to you right away. The first is he's near you right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that he is the Lord and if you confess him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us. Um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. Uh, if you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.